Hey, hey, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Give you just a few minutes to get linked on here. Let us know you, you're watching and you're there and you can, uh, you can hear us. Hey, Shama, my niece, Brother James, God bless you guys. I see we got some people coming on, so uh, we appreciate it. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, we uh, go ahead and share the video if you can. Go ahead and share, share, and share. And we'll definitely appreciate that. Give a few more moments as we do uh, every week. Of course, we want we delay just a few moments, so uh, be patient if you can for three, four minutes, and uh, we'll go ahead and jump in uh, to the teaching. Uh, brother Rory, hey, Pastor Mario, my big brother, God bless you. <sighs> my mom, Sister Mobley, thank God for you, and Brother Aaron Stormit, God bless you, brother. We'll uh, we'll just start up here in just a moment. God bless you, Sister Glenda. Praise God, praise God. Okay, we are up to 15, so share, share, and share. Sister Heather, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you. Um, up church family, God bless you guys. Pastor friends of mine there, God bless you guys. Sister Patricia. Uh, of course, we're studying on the person and work of the Holy Spirit, so uh, we definitely want to uh, continue to, you know, uh, study this. And I believe God is um, has so much to say in His Holy Word concerning uh, the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is, the work of the Spirit in our lives. Let me tell you, there's so much we can say about the person of the Holy Spirit, uh, but. Uh, first and foremost, we have to understand who the Holy Spirit is, who the Holy Spirit is not. And it begins to open up to us uh, the work of the Spirit. If you don't know who he is, how will we know how he works uh, and what he can do? So uh, that's what we're going to be looking at tonight, the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to start here in just a few, few more moments. Uh, the numbers are going up, so we appreciate that. I see we got 22 on 21 so uh go ahead and share uh, i'm asking you know god bless you guys uh if you guys don't mind it's, it's not a favor to me per se but it's to invite other people on to watch the video so if you're watching please hit the share button and share the video and it will be a blessing to uh someone else as well not because of who is on obviously i'm nothing but because of the content of of, of the teaching uh, tonight. So we're going to jump back into the book of John, the gospel of John, uh, chapter 14, the gospel according to John, chapter 14 and verse uh, 15. And we're going to be looking at the person and work of the Holy Spirit. It says here, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now think about that, that he may abide with you forever. John chapter 14, if you're just joining, and verse 15. Uh, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter, that he will abide with you forever. And even, here it is, verse 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him but you know him. 
for he dwells with you and shall be in you. And then Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And he's speaking uh, in and through the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to be dealing with tonight, the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Let's say a quick prayer and we're going to jump into this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to come before your people tonight. Uh, Lord, we just give you glory and praise and we ask that you would anoint us once again, Lord. We need your help in order to carry out this task. Anoint us to minister, to teach, and to preach. And anoint the people to hear what I believe that you have given us. And Lord, we give you the glory and praise and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, as we study the Holy Spirit, I think it's important that we start off tonight by uh, saying what the Holy Spirit is. Uh, is not uh, because the question has to be asked who or what is the Holy Spirit and you know this is a question that has been asked by so many people uh, this is a question that has been uh, debated over the years in the church in the body of Christ who is the Holy Spirit and as we you know approach the word it's important that we give the answer to this question from a biblical standpoint and not our own opinions uh so as you study the scriptures even from the beginning of time you'll see in the book of genesis chapter one the bible says in the beginning uh, god created the heavens and the earth and then it goes on to say and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and then it says the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters. Uh, you know, we talked initially on the Trinity, the triune God here. And obviously there are many, there's a lot of debate on that subject. We'll dive into that a little bit tonight too, because when dealing with the person of the spirit, we've got to deal with who the Holy Spirit is in the Godhead. And uh, as you look in the scriptures, again, you see God in the beginning, God. He created the heavens and the earth. The Holy Spirit is the one who carries out everything that the Godhead devises in uh, the heavens. So when you think about it for just a moment, every single thing that has ever been spoken, devised, or done by God has been carried out by the Holy Spirit with the exception of the earthly ministry of Christ. God became man. That's what the incarnation is all about. Let me tell you something, saints. Our foundational truth and foundational beliefs as Christians is the fact that God became man. You, you, you have to believe that in order to be a Christian. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah uh, that a virgin would bring forth a child and his name would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then when you turn over into Matthew, you'll find that this child is born and the Bible says he will save his people from their sins. How could he save his people from their sins is because of who he was. And obviously because of who he was, he lived this life perfect. He was a man who lived a perfect life. And because of the perfection of Christ, he was fit to offer himself as a ransom or the sin debt for the entirety of the world. That whosoever will can call on the name of the Lord and they will be saved. God's requirement of salvation is simple. Look to my son, Jesus Christ, and what he's done at Calvary, and you can be and will be saved. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes, that's salvation. There's no adding to that, taking away from it. We've added all of this stuff over the years. Well, you got to be baptized in water in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to be saved. You got to be baptized in water in Jesus' name only in order to be saved. You got to join this church. You got to shake this preacher hands. No, simplicity is important. And the Bible teaches us that if we simply believe in Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's done, we will be saved. In Acts chapter 16, when the jailer was about to take his life and the, they said, do thyself no harm. He asked the question, what must I do to be saved? And this man knew nothing about salvation. This man knew nothing. And it was vital that the preacher of the gospel give him truth. And the truth that this preacher gave him was this, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He 
didn't say you had to speak in tongues. He didn't say you had to join a church. He did not say you had to link up with some group. He simply said to believe on the Lord and you shall be saved. So when we start thinking about this, the Holy Spirit, with the exception of the earthly ministry of Christ, however, he anointed Christ. He was upon Christ. And even upon the time that Jesus died, the Holy Spirit was there. And he is the one who told Jesus when it was time to die. Uh, Hebrews 9, 14, for a scriptural reference, tells us that through the eternal spirit, Jesus died on the cross. So who or what is the Holy Spirit? First of all, the Holy Spirit is not some strong force. He is not some feeling that we have. The Holy Spirit is not just some uh, electric energy or something we feel when we're in church. The Holy Spirit is not just some uh, some weird thought process or some something, all of these things that we've come up with. First of all, the Holy Spirit is a person. And we've got to understand that he thinks, he feels, he loves, he has passions uh, for his people, for the people who are here living in this earth, the Holy Spirit, those who are saved, he indwells the heart of the believer. Even in our text tonight, the Bible says, uh, Jesus said this in verse 16, and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter and that he. Now, I mean, if this was not a person, Jesus would not have said he, he will abide with you forever. So we've got to understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is God. So he's all knowing, all seeing, uh, without uh, any lack in knowledge, without any lack in ability, without any lack in power. That means that there is nothing that the Spirit of God can not do. Now, this is important that we understand that the Holy Spirit is God. Hence, he can do anything. He can do anything. And, and then we've got to go further to say because of the new covenant, because of the finished work of the cross, because of what Jesus did at the cross, the Holy Spirit has a legal right, a legal right to indwell the heart of the believer. How? Because that believer, that temple has been cleansed and washed in the blood and has been made a place that is suitable for God through his spirit to dwell on the inside of us. So the Holy Spirit is God. Somebody said, brother, I do not believe that the Holy Spirit is not God. Uh, just a moment. And, and, and let's, let's look at the Bible. I don't want to give you my opinion. I just want to give you the Bible. First of all, let's look at the book of Acts chapter five. Acts chapter five and verse uh, number three says this, but Peter said, this is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, this is obviously, we've heard this story. If you read your word, you know uh, this story. Uh, the young man lied. And when Peter uh, heard the lie of this young man, Peter asked him a question that's important. Verse three of Acts chapter five says, but Peter said unto Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Think about that, to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land. While it remained, verse four, was it not? your own and after it was sold was it not your own power in your own power why have you conceived this thing in your heart he says you have not lied unto men but look at the text but unto god so this text tells us the holy spirit is god peter I mean, surely this is inspired. Obviously, all scripture is given by inspiration. So we know through scripture that, uh, that, that, that the word of God is God breathed. It is divinely inspired. Peter said there is no private interpretation of scripture, but all men wrote as they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. So Acts chapter five, uh, verse three and four tells us that Ananias did not lie unto men, but he lied to the Holy Spirit who is God. You can't take that out of the scripture. You cannot deny it. It's right there in the text. Uh, number two, the Holy Spirit is God. And not only is he God, but he speaks. Acts chapter 13 and verse one says, now there were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, Simon, Simeon, who was called uh, Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaean, which had been brought up 
with Herod, the Tetrarchs, and, the Saul, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, notice the terminology, the Holy Spirit said, while they were praying, the Spirit of God speaks and says, separate unto me, uh, separate, I'm sorry, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, uh, Saul and Barnabas, for the work I have called unto them. Notice these pronouns here. The Bible says, separate me. The Holy Spirit is a person. He refers to himself. This pronoun tells us, I mean, simple grammar will show us that this is not some figment of our imagination. This is not just some uh, 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 feeling or this is not some strong force, but the Holy Spirit is a person who feels. He speaks and he said, separate me, Paul and uh, Saul and Barnabas, for the work I. He refers to himself as I. He is a person who is speaking. So he's God. He sends these men on this first missionary journey. And of course, we know uh, the rest of the story. So in order to properly understand this, we've got to understand that the Holy Spirit speaks. He's God. What do we believe, saints of God? We don't believe in three gods. We don't believe uh, that the Holy Spirit is 33% God. We don't believe that Jesus is 33% God or that the Father is 33% God. We believe that God is eternally existent in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not three distinct personalities, but three distinct persons. I heard one preacher say uh, that we who are Trinitarian believe that God is a schizophrenic, which I believe is a very disrespectful thing to say. But he said God is, uh, we claim that God is schizo in that he has three personalities. Well, you, you've gone wrong even in your initial uh, 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 attack because we don't teach that God is three personalities. We actually believe and teach not from a doctrinal standpoint that was passed on to us from this person or that person, but from what the word of God says. Listen, the pastor is not the final authority. The bishop is not the final authority. The apostle, the prophet, the, 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 the evangelist is not the final authority. The final authority is the word of God. And if we make the final authority church rule or men, then we go astray in our doctrine. And this, this is where all of this doctrine or false doctrine comes in at number one, because the church has no discernment and we cannot identify false doctrine. Number two, Two is we start, we stop studying the Bible for ourselves and we take man's word for it. Listen, I want you to hear this teaching tonight. However, I want you to open your Bible honestly and say, Lord, what does your word say? Because revelation doesn't come from me. Revelation comes from the Lord. And so if we'll study the Bible, we'll begin to, it'll open up to us. Now I'm going to be very, uh, uh, I'm going to hammer on this point for just a moment because uh, the, the Bible teaches us that God is eternally existent in three distinct persons. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is not just a man. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. I mean, Paul said in Philippians, I know my Jehovah's Witnesses friends say he was just a man. I know the Muslim friends say that he was just a good man or a good prophet. But let me tell you something. Jesus was not just a good man. Jesus Christ is the son of God. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Paul said he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. No one else could have that line. No, that could not be said of anyone else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've got to understand that we believe God is eternally existent in three persons, God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, brother, you're going to have to give me scripture on that. Go to the book of Revelation. Now, uh, if we, as we read the book of Revelation, uh, we've got to understand something about the Bible. Uh, the Bible tells us uh, here over and over again, uh, that, of course, who Jesus is, who the father is. Uh, the Bible shows us several different times of these distinct persons in, in several different parts. When Jesus was baptized, we see three distinct persons, the father speaking from heaven, Jesus in the water being baptized and the Holy Spirit descending upon him as a dove. So we see the three distinct persons as well as we go to the scripture. You'll see several times where uh, Paul in his letters would say grace be unto you and peace 
from God our Father, here's the conjunction, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul shows us the distinction here of two persons. And of course, the scripture is given by inspiration, so it is the Holy Spirit who has divinely inspired what Paul said. Now, my uh, contention is this. I'm not talking to people who don't believe the Bible. I'm talking to Bible-believing Christians out there. If you are a Bible-believing Christian, I mean someone who believes what the Bible says, then you cannot just throw away what this scripture says in Revelation chapter one and verse four, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace, notice this, from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And notice the conjunction and distinction from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, you see this, the seven spirits here doesn't speak of seven spirits, but it, it's, a, it's a symbolism here showing us that the Holy Spirit here is to, in totality, totality of completion, illumination complete, all knowledge, all understanding. He's omnipresent, omniscient, all seeing, all powerful, in all places, at all times. He knows all things. So as you look at the text, he tells us of the distinction from two. Verse five, I'm sorry, verse four says, and there's a conjunction that shows us he's fixing to talk about somebody else. Simple grammar. And then verse five says another and. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a third person and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of uh, the dead. So the Bible shows us three here. If you keep reading Revelation, you'll start to find in Revelation chapter three, after the time of the churches, this is the heavenly scene. I want you to think about this. This is what John saw in heaven. This is not uh, the account of somebody who is just uh, out of their mind. Again, if we believe the Bible, we have to come to these conclusions because this is right here in our scripture now. In Revelation chapter three, John, the same one, this is a vision. The Lord showed him what literally was taking place in heaven. And, and this is what the Bible says, unto the angel of the church, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter four. And verse one, he says this, after this, I looked after the time of the churches, behold, a door. The first voice which I heard uh, was like a trumpet speaking, which said, come up hither. And then John said, I was in the spirit in verse two and behold a throne which sat in heaven. And there was one, notice the term, who sat on the throne, saints. This is the father. Somebody said, I don't believe that. Let's keep reading and we'll begin to see it. This was the father who was sitting on the throne. Let's keep reading and go over to Revelation chapter five. Now in Revelation chapter four, you will see them singing the four and 20 elders and the four beasts who were around the throne of the father. And they said, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, power. You have created all things for your pleasure. They were created. They were worshiping God. I had a Jehovah's Witness to tell me Jesus is not God. He is not deity. Therefore, we should not worship him. You're going to have to take Revelation chapter five out of the Bible because here he is. He said, and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside, and it had seven seals. Now, there was a book in God the Father's hand. And then John, the Bible says in verse two, uh, John uh, he said, who is worthy to open the book or to take the book out of his hand? And then the Bible says, who is worthy to open the book to loose the seals? Verse three says, no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under earth was able to open the book. Satan couldn't take the book. The Antichrist couldn't take the book. Uh, the prophet, let me tell you something. For those of us who laudate and lift up men, Moses couldn't take the book. David, as great as he was, he couldn't take the book. He wasn't worthy to take the book. I mean, my God, Paul, as anointed and powerful, he wasn't worthy to take the book. Torrance is not worthy to take the book. But then John John began to weep because he couldn't find a man that was worthy to take the book. And then one of the elders said this, and I love this. He said, listen, he said, weep not. Behold, the lion 
of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. He has prevailed to open the book and to loose the steel, the seals of the book. And behold, lo, in the midst of the throne, the four beasts and the elders stood as the lamb as had been slain. Ha, look, think about this. Having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits. You see the father sitting on the throne. That's one. You see the son who is the lamb comes and the only one who is worthy to take the book. That's two. And which are the seven spirits of God who is where? Who is sent forth into the earth. Remember, let's go back to our text. The Bible says, I will send you another comforter. It's right here in the Bible. If we will open up and simply receive of what God says, he said, I will send you. So the seven spirits have been sent. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, came and took the book out of the hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he took the book, the Bible says the four beasts and the 20 elders fell down before the lamb. And, and they, they began to play music and they sung a new song. And the Bible says they sung and said, you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals. You were slain. Praise God. He's, the Bible says you were slain. In other words, he was dead. But saints, he's no longer dead. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, death has no more dominion over him. The Bible says that he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. John chapter 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. My God, I mean, think about that. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I am the light of the world. Saints, he is everything that we need. He was not just a man. He was dead, but now he's risen from the dead. Think about that for just a moment. And then the spirit of God was right there because he's been sent back into the earth. You cannot tell me now, we can debate all day, but you cannot see the distinction of three persons here and that all three are God. So, I mean, we have to stop that debate and go on and begin to say, instead of denying who God is, let's say, Lord, you are who you are, and I take you at your word. I believe who you are, and I just want you to use me because I'm nothing within and of myself. So who am I to deny who you are? Are. The Bible says if you're going to come to God, you first have to believe that he is God. So you can't deny his person and then say, I want you to use me. No, you got to say, Lord, yes to you. And I want you to do with me what you will. So in Jesus and the Bible and to finish this point. Uh, they said he was he, he, uh, you were slain and have redeemed us. Two gods, two distinct persons here. The lamb has redeemed us. He purchased us out of the sin markets, out of the slave markets of bondage and in sin. He paid a ransom. And this is, listen, let me tell you something. This cancels every debt. This cancels out all racism and hatred and bigotry because every one of us have the common denominator and it's not a skin problem, it's a sin problem. All of us, it doesn't matter what race you are black, white. There is no superiority in any race. We are all bound by sin. And there's one color that matters and it is the crimson blood of the lamb. And he poured that blood out. He didn't pay more for me than he did for you. All of us were slaves. All of us cost the same thing. And he said he didn't purchase us with corruptible things as silver and gold, but he purchased us by the precious blood of of the lamb. We were purchased saints of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of this finished work and look at the Bible. And he said, I heard the voice of many angels about the throne, thousands and thousands and 10,000s. I mean, all of these angels were singing with a loud voice when they saw the lamb. This was not just a man. This was the man, Jesus Christ. Worthy is the lamb. Praise the name of the Lord, which was slain to, and he receives power, riches, his wisdom, strength, honor, glory, blessing, and every creature in heaven and on earth and under earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard them singing. That was such a rumble in heaven when the lamb came forth to take the book. And then they looked and said, blessing and honor and glory, hallelujah, and power be unto him who sits on the throne and unto the lamb. So the distinction here, they said glory and power and, and, and honor to, to the father who 
who sits on the throne. And look at, they made these two equal and to him who, who, my God, and unto the lamb forever. So it shows he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Let me tell you something. You cannot deny who he is. And then when you start to look at it, this one, Jesus Christ purchased us. So when he went back into heaven, Hebrews chapter four says we not, we don't have a high priest that cannot be touched with the filling of our infirmities, but think about it. He is passed into the heavens, which speaks of a legal process. When Jesus passed into the heavens, he offered the father a perfect righteousness. Now, because of the cross, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter two and verse 13, you who sometimes were afar off have been made nigh by the blood because he poured out his life. We can draw close to God. And then he said, I'm not going, he said, listen, he tells us to be holy. He tells us to live a life that's pleasing to him. He said, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you to where you think you can bring this life about on your own. I'm going to send you the comforter. I'm going to send you the third person of the Godhead because listen, a man can't cover you and bring you into sanctification and perfection. But my God, a pastor can't do that. A bishop can't do that. But God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit can rip away the nicotine. He he can rip away the lust. He can rip away all of the bondages that have gripped us over the years. And he can bring us, he who had begun a good work in us is able to complete and finish that work until the end time, which we know is the great rapture of the church. Saints of God, the Holy Spirit is in us. He dwells, according to our text, on the inside of us. So he is God. Think about it tonight. And that's what really I want to emphasize that point tonight. If we don't get any further, we're going to close it here in just a moment. The Holy Spirit is God. That means there's nothing that he cannot do. So I avail myself to this power by looking exclusively, not to my own performance, not to my church, but I look to what Christ did for me because he's a worthy, praise God. He is the lamb of God and he's worthy. And because of what he did, you and I can trust in what he did. And God says, I'm going to give you the comforter and he's going to help you. This means helper. He is the paracletos. He is the one who comes alongside and helps. Think about it. The Holy Spirit is not the doer. He's the helper. He's not going to live your life for you, but he will help you live the Christian life. How will he help me? Because I'm going to get back. Remember what Paul said in Galatians chapter two, he says, yet not I, but Christ. In other words, I'm not going to try to live this life trusting in myself, trusting in my own ability. I'm going to live this Christian life trusting in what Christ did for me. And the Holy Spirit now has the latitude to work in my life and change me. I'm not where I want to be. I'm, I'm, I'm progressively growing in this and understanding this. And the spirit of God is changing us. Saints, I'm going to emphasize it one more time and we're going to close the spirit of God. He is God. We're dealing with the person and work of the Holy Spirit. He is God. And because he's God, he can do anything. And think about it. The Bible says he will abide with you forever. He, this is because of the cross. And we're going to get to that point on next week. The Holy Spirit can take up permanent residence in our lives and abide with us forever. You, saint of God, are not comfortless. You are not alone. You are not, I don't care how alienated you feel, how helpless or hopeless you feel. If you are a born again believer, I don't care if everybody's walked away, the Holy Spirit is indwelt in your heart. And Jesus said, lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the earth. God bless you tonight. We love you guys. Please pray for us. And we're going to be back next Tuesday night, same time, same place. Invite someone else to come on and watch. And we'll be back with you again. God bless.